Coming on the air with the White House on defense. President Biden here saying he will not stop construction on a new border wall, even though he kind of promised the opposite on the campaign trail. What changed and why he says he had no other choice? Plus, new moves from former President Trump tonight to try to toss out the case against him here in Washington. But he says his time in the White House should protect him from prosecution and whether that could actually work. Then, the man whose case inspired this serial podcast is back in court today, but not to decide whether he's innocent or guilty of murder, why the victim's family says their rights were violated. Plus, new allegations of abuse tonight against former CEO of Abercrombie and Fitch, the disturbing details of alleged sex parties with young men while he was head of the company. And can biohacking your body help you age backwards? Our Gotti Schwartz investigates the new do-it-yourself approach to the fountain of youth later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and any minute now, we should be hearing from the Secretary of State who is over in Mexico City, where the Biden administration's top cabinet officials, you see this live here, have been meeting with Mexican officials as intention on the border crisis is intensifying in a big way. It comes as President Biden is defending a huge reversal on immigration, saying he had no choice but to let more border wall be built, given the number of migrants trying to cross into the U.S. Listen. The border wall, the money was appropriated for the border wall. I tried to get them to reappropriate, to redirect that money. They didn't. They wouldn't. And in the meantime, there's nothing under the law other than they have to use the money for what was appropriate. I can't stop that. Do you believe the border wall works? No. The administration's basically saying its hands are tied here, that their decision to waive more than two dozen federal laws to open the door to more border wall getting built has nothing to do with pressure from other Democrats, like leaders in New York and Chicago. They've been sounding the alarm about the surge of migrants heading into their cities, overwhelming the resources they have. The whole thing's surprising, because now President Biden spent a lot of the 2020 campaign as a candidate promising to do the opposite about the border wall. There will not be another foot of wall constructed on my administration. Not another foot, he said. This is all part of a broader border battle here, not just about the wall, but about the river separating Texas from Mexico. With the Justice Department today saying Texas broke the law by putting up this controversial thousand foot floating barrier in the river. But the state saying it's allowed to do it. It doesn't need permission from the feds because the construction is not permanent. These buoys are temporary. They are designed to be tactical and moved. And that does not create the type of long-term obstruction that Your Honor is pointing to in Rio Grande. Guad Venegas is joining us now. Guad, for somebody who campaigned against more border wall, this is obviously a change here. The Biden administration, in to some degree, is pointing to numbers to justify why this is needed, given 245,000 migrants coming into the U.S. this year so far. But we know there's also been pressure inside their own party, inside the Democratic Party. Talk us through it. Hallie, uh, this shows a lack of understanding of what happens at the southern border, not just by people in D.C., but politicians all across the United States. You know, I've been reporting on this issue for years at Telemundo, our, our sister network, and also here at NBC News. And it's amazing how politicians sometimes don't understand what is happening at the border. So for Biden to campaign and say that they would not build any border walls during his administration, uh, that's a difficult thing to say because every other administration before him, Republicans, and Democrats had built parts of the wall and sections of the wall, of course, but this became more of a political statement uh, because, of course, of what happened during the Trump administration. So what we know now is that we have this uh, legal battle happening because of these uh, the floating barriers or the buoys that we have uh, in Texas at the moment. So regardless of what happens there, we know that uh, there's a court of appeals that heard the arguments, as you mentioned today. Regardless of what happens there, Hallie, uh, Governor Abbott now uh, has a win for him because the Biden administration has announced that they're going to clear the way, right, to build more wall in that part of Texas. And, uh, you know, this isn't the first part of the United States that is planning to build a wall where perhaps it could be 
be necessary to control the flow of migrants. You look at what's uh, been built in San Diego, for example, a border wall that was built by Democrats, a border wall that has helped guide the way migrants come and turn themselves in. Uh, of course, they also have issues of their own. But overall, when we look at the big picture, Hallie, uh, we do have to point out the fact that we've never seen the numbers that we have today arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border, that we have a crisis happening in South America, and we have large masses of immigrants, not only the numbers that we see at the border now, Hallie, but also those traveling through Central America and through Mexico. And that's why these decisions are probably being made. We talk about how this is one part of a broader whole here, and I so appreciate you putting this into context based on your many years, I know, of reporting on this issue. But you look at the thing that was um, sort of very controversial, still is, those floating barriers in the river separating Texas from Mexico. There's been this fight between the administration and the state, obviously a, a Republican-led state, to get those barriers out. There's been a concern from a humanitarian basis, from, for example, advocates for those migrants. Is this latest push by the DOJ going to make a difference here or no? So when you talk about those, the floating barrier, Hallie, it's a political statement. It's a short section of the river. Many of the migrants who would have crossed there have gone around them. So uh, they are very dangerous. Uh, they do create a hazard in the water. Uh, legally, the argument is being made by the federal government that they have the jurisdiction in that part of the water. The state in Texas is arguing that they do have a right to place uh, that barrier there. But again, it's a political statement. It didn't make a difference because we've seen the numbers increase when it comes to the migrants. Migrants arriving in the U.S. in that part of the border since uh, that barrier was placed in that area, Hallie. Guad Venegas, thank you very much. We'll be staying on top of this, I know, as this story develops. Former President Trump today saying that presidential immunity should protect him from getting prosecuted in the federal case against him over election interference in 2020, according to a new court filing. His attorneys are trying to get this whole thing dismissed. They want it tossed out of court. They say his push to try to stay in office after losing was at the heart of his responsibilities, of his official responsibilities as president. Remember, Mr. Trump got indicted by a federal grand jury back in August, and this is just the first in what's expected to be a long list of motions filed in front of the judge in this case, ahead of a deadline next week. Ken Delanian is joining us now. It is the sort of presidential immunity argument here, not unexpected from Donald Trump. If they convince a judge that that should hold here, that's it, right? The case would be dismissed. He doesn't have to go to trial. What's the likelihood of that happening? With this judge, Tanya Chutkin, I would say close to zero, Hallie. This mm. is the judge, after all, that uh, famously uh, used the phrase, presidents are not kings, when she ruled against Donald Trump on a question of whether he had to turn over material to the January 6th committee. But um, who knows what's going to happen when this thing, when this question gets to the conservative U.S. Supreme Court, which, which has a view of presidential power that is probably as robust as any court in history. Um, but, you know, and, and they cite a Supreme Court case uh, involving Richard Nixon. That, was, that one was involving civil cases, but it held that a president uh, in conducting his regular standard duties cannot be held liable for civil damages. Now, what uh, the prosecution is undoubtedly going to push back on and argue is that there were a lot of things that they're alleging in this indictment that had nothing to do with Donald Trump's role as president, but really had to do with his, his role as an, an elected politician uh, trying to manipulate uh, the results of the 2020 election. And they're also going to argue that even if he was acting as president, presidents are not um, above the law. They're not immune from criminal prosecution. We'll have to see what the courts do with it. Today's filing only focuses on that whole immunity argument, but the former president's attorneys say there are other um, what they call fatal deficiencies. They see issues with the indictment here. What does that mean? What can we expect from them? Yeah, well, one argument they're going to make, even if they lose on this one, is that uh, um, most of what Donald Trump was saying and doing about election fraud was covered by the First Amendment, that it was speech. He had a right to do it, whether he was wrong or right, that he, he had a right to call uh, uh, state legislative officials and urge them to examine fraud. Now, obviously, what uh, Jack Smith has alleged in the indictment is that, um, he, well, he certainly did have that right. What he did and said went beyond that, and it bordered into the realm of a criminal conspiracy. That's really the whole question that's going to be before a jury. It's hard to imagine the case getting tossed by a judge on those grounds, Helen. Ken Delanian, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Back here in Washington, you got everybody looking to next week here, right, as the pieces fall into place for what could be a pretty tense fight to figure out who should be the next Speaker of the House. And today, a wild card who goes by the name of Donald Trump. Here he is. There's a potential visit to the Capitol by him 
coming up just a few days from now, which could mark his first visit to the Capitol grounds since January 6th. A Republican lawmaker telling us that Mr. Trump wants to come and, I'm quoting here, unify the party ahead of the speakership election. It comes as we're speaking exclusively to one of the official candidates for speaker. And he's answering a big question lingering over the hill right now. What do you do about Congressman Matt Gates, the guy who lit the match that ended with the fire that put out now former Speaker McCarthy's hopes of continuing to remain leader of the party? Listen to Jim Jordan. Would you support expelling Matt Gates from the Republican conference? I don't, I don't you know, I've never been for um, those, kind of, those kind of things. Um, I don't think that's warranted. I'm not for that, and we certainly can't do that when you only got a four-seat majority. That's Congressman Jordan and our own Ali Vitale. Of course, Jordan is the judiciary chair. He has been aggressive in investigating the Biden family. He is a sort of conservative, ultra-conservative Republican here running for speaker against Steve Scalise, who's already in leadership. He's the number two in the House. Republicans are going to have this closed-door meeting Tuesday, right? So five days from now. You see it on the calendar here. The hope, the thinking, perhaps, maybe, is that they're going to hash out some differences. They'll be like, all right, here's the new speaker. Based on what we've seen over the past 72 hours, that seems like maybe an uphill climb, a kumbaya moment, maybe not super likely. Also on Tuesday, by the way, you see it in the other color there, Democrats are set to have their own meeting, telling members they're going to work on their own speakership plans to unify behind Hakeem Jeffries. Nothing that Republicans, Democrats, or Mr. Trump, for that matter, does is really going to matter until they fill the speaker's chair. And nothing's going to happen until the clops, uh, in, in, as far as, like, policy, right? Like, nothing's going to stop this government deadline, government funding deadline coming up here on November 17th. Ali Vitali is joining us now. Save me from myself, Ali. You know what I'm trying to say here, right? The idea that, like, we got this big speaker fight. And then we have this government shutdown deadline coming up in just about 40 days. But let me yeah. start here with the other... We, we said it. It is a wild card in the mix, a wild card who used to be president. What is the appetite where you are for Donald Trump to come and, quote-unquote, unify the party? Is that what people want? It really depends who you talk to. Most of the people that I've asked this do not want Trump anywhere near this. And it's why, if anyone has numbers problems, certainly the former president has the biggest problem with getting to that magic number of 217 to actually become speaker. Yeah, technically, in the rules, he could. But that doesn't mean that it's any more likely. What instead our sources are telling us is that he has an interest, and he's really floated this. This is not hard and fast, that he might try to come to the Capitol on Tuesday when all of these other House Republicans are behind closed doors hearing pitches from would-be speakers that he might try to come and be a unifying factor. Personally, I'm not really sure that that would go well. I don't think it would help things. But nevertheless, you've got people like Troy Nell saying that they hear that Trump should come, that people want him. So we'll see where it lands. So, listen, I, I think that whether or not there is an appetite for Donald Trump to be the Speaker of the House. What we do know is that there are two official candidates who are running to be Speaker of the House. You talked yeah. with one of them today exclusively. <laughs> what would a Speaker Jim Jordan look like, and what would look different about that than Speaker Steve Scalise? That's one of the questions that I think members are asking as they field phone calls from Jordan Scalise and also Kevin Hearn, the head of the Republican Study Committee, who I reported earlier today, has been making his phone call rounds as well. Everyone's very busy on the phone right now. But when you look at Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan next to each other in a binary, both of these people were close in terms of alignment with Kevin McCarthy on Jordan's front. It was steadfastness and support against multiple challenges over the course of McCarthy's speakership. For Scalise, it was technically serving in McCarthy's leadership apparatus, though there is certain mistrust between those two camps because both of these men have risen through the ranks together. They're equally ambitious. But also the fact that both Jordan and Scalise seem to be trying to pull from the same place. Most of the rank and file could probably get behind them, but there are certain weaknesses that they have. I mean, for Jordan, it's that centrists or moderates might be worried about his firebrand persona. For Scalise, he is also still actively receiving treatment for blood cancer that was diagnosed in August. It's why in all those videos that you see of him, he's wearing a mask. It's because he's actually going through chemo. But the other question here for Jim Jordan is, what about the motion to vacate? And I asked him that. Watch. Would you support changing the rules, especially the motion to vacate? That is a conference decision, but I tell you what, uh, if that's what the conference wants to do, then I would support it. The, the, the question becomes is you got to have all you got to have all of us on board for that. I wouldn't go to Democrats to get votes because they're going to want something, you know, they're going to want something. But Hallie, for any speaker, how is their speakership different than Kevin McCarthy's if they keep the motion to vacate at one? 
Well, that is the question, right? I mean, like, that's what it all comes down to. And I thought that your uh, answer from Jim Jordan was super illuminating on that, the idea yeah. that he's like, well, it's, it's history. You know, Ali Vitale, lots to follow over the next week. Thank you, friend, for being on. One of the issues fueling a lot of the tension here in Washington right now is part and parcel of that speaker fight, and that is what happens to the future of money to help Ukraine fight Russia, the divisions in Congress and across America over whether billions of American dollars should continue to flow there. Any minute, Secretary of State Blinken, as we told you, is going to be speaking live. We are waiting for this to begin. He, of course, is one of the faces of the Biden administration's push to try to keep that faucet open at the same time. Ukraine is now seeing one of its deadliest attacks on civilians since that war began. More than 50 people killed after what the Ukrainians said was a Russian missile that came down on a village, accounting for more than a sixth of the people who live there. One in six people who lived in that village now gone. You can see some of the just horrific scenes here. Body after body pulled from the rubble. You don't even see buildings because they're all leveled. NBC's Raf Sanchez is following the latest for us. What else do we know about this attack and what it says about where Russia's strategy is, Raf? So, Hallie, this strike took place in the Kharkiv region in northeastern Ukraine. It's a place I've spent a lot of time. It is a region that has suffered unbelievably over the course of the war. But even there, with everything these people have gone through, folks on the ground are absolutely stunned by the scale of the loss of life today. As you said, this is a village. It's called Proza. It's a home to 300 people, 51 of whom were killed in a single instant when this Russian missile came down earlier today. That's according to Ukrainian officials. Among the dead is a six-year-old boy. And Hallie, grim, grim irony, the reason all of these people were concentrated in one area is they were at a memorial for a neighbor who had been killed by the Russians earlier on. Now, in terms of what this says about Russia's war effort, it shows you that as they continue to be unable to defeat the, the Ukrainians on the battlefield, they are also continuing to target Ukrainian civilian areas. This is a village about 30 miles behind the front lines. There's absolutely no evidence that there were any legitimate military targets in the area. And people in Kharkiv have declared three days of mourning. Hallie. We've been talking about what is the nexus, Raf, to where um, you are overseas and where I am here domestically in Washington. And that's the idea of what we just said, right? Do you keep the money flowing, that faucet open to Ukraine? The president has cast this in terms of life or death. I mean, that is how the Biden administration sees this, as something that is absolutely necessary. Not everybody in Congress, specifically on the Republican side of the aisle, sees it that way. Even in that party, there are divisions. Where does this go? Uh, as we are seeing, of course, the Ukrainians make a very vigorous case to continue to, to help them. Yes, yeah, so President Zelensky continuing to make that case in Spain today, trying to bolster Western support for his war effort. He made very clear that he is keeping an extremely close eye on what's happening where you are in Washington. Take a listen to a little bit of what he had to say in Spain earlier. I think it's too late for us to worry. I think we have to work on it. Difficult um, election period for, for, the, for the United States, different voices. Some of the voices are very strange. Strange voices, says President Zelensky, as he tries to keep that faucet open, to keep American support going to Ukraine. As you know, Hallie, that 45-day continuing resolution to yeah. keep the government open does not include funding for Ukraine. Right. The Ukrainians very nervous about it. President Biden says he's anxious about it, too. Hallie. The question is, what happens come end of November? Raf Sanchez, thank you so much. We've got some breaking news into us in just the last couple of minutes here. We're learning that Tropical Storm Felipe has outer bands just now reaching Bermuda, expected to hit the island tomorrow, then head on toward Maine this weekend. A lot of wind, a lot of rain headed your way if you live in northern New England. Meteorologist Bill Karens is following this one for us. Give us the forecast. How bad is it going to be for Bermuda? How bad is it going to be for New England? Yeah, Hallie, uh, everyone that went through uh, Hurricane Lee, which was in post-tropical and lost power in Maine and Nova Scotia, is like, what do we do to deserve this? You know, two storms in roughly three, three and a half weeks. So Bermuda's already in the rain. They're already in the clouds. Uh, max winds are about 50 miles per hour. This is a messy storm. This is not like, you know, you get an eye. It's like a well-organized storm. It's almost like it's going to turn into a hybrid storm, almost like a nor'easter, without the snow, just a lot of rain. And here's the new path from the Hurricane Center. They do have it coming up 
near Nova Scotia, then bending into Maine. This would be Saturday night into early Sunday morning, and then it's going up in here in Quebec and dissipates after that. Notice max winds are at 60 miles per hour. My thresholds for people losing power, usually you need wind gusts over 45, maybe even over 50 miles per hour. And so that's likely mostly to the right of the track, so that's going to be in Nova Scotia. I don't think the power outages in Maine, Lee lost 125,000 people lost power. I don't think those numbers will be that high with this storm. Our computer model are pretty much in good agreement, bending it here towards Maine as we go throughout Saturday. I don't expect the path of the storm really to change much. The rainfall will be the biggest story. If we're going to get any problems from flash flooding, it's likely going to be in the mountainous areas of northern Maine and also in the Adirondacks. That's where we could get two to three inches of rain. Of course, the leaves are coming down that tends to clog the drains, and that could also have some issues. As far as the max winds go, it's going to be windy. So as we go through, this is Saturday, Provincetown, Nantucket, wind gusts in the 30 to 40, maybe even up to 50 mile per hour range. So it's going to be a windy day on the Cape, but not too many power outages. Down East Maine, it looks like Saturday night, and then Nova Scotia, same for you. That's when the highest wind gusts will occur. Bar Harbor up to 60, uh, Yarmouth just about at 62, and that's where we could see isolated power outages and some down tree lines, Hallie. So again, this isn't going to be a huge high impact event, but I think the biggest it, 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 a problem and monetary problem, this is like peak foliage weekend in all of northern New England, and so many people are going to lose a ton of money from the tourists that are going to cancel all their plans from the hotels and the tours and all the farms and apple picking and I think that's the biggest impact it's just another rainy weekend in New England mm -hmm. and a lot of businesses taking it on the chin. Bill Karens, thank you very much for that appreciate it. The man whose case was made famous by the serial podcast is back in court today arguing for justice for a murder he says he didn't commit but spent more than two years behind bars for. Listen. We look forward to hearing the court's decision, and we're hoping that in the end, you know, we'll have a chance to prove justice, not just for Hayes' family, but for our family as well. This all, two decades, I should have said, this all centers around the 1999 murder of Adnan Syed's former girlfriend, 18-year-old Heyman Lee. Police say they found evidence that indicated he committed the murder. In 2000, he was found guilty by a jury, sentenced to life in prison. Fast forward 14 years later, right, that's when Serial, the podcast, comes out about that crime and uncovered some new evidence, poked holes in the case, tons of people listening to every development. Whatever the motivation is to kill someone, I had absolutely, it didn't exist in me. After the podcast aired, officials went back and looked at everything, which led to this long back and forth over whether Syed should be allowed to have a new trial. It went all the way up to Maryland Supreme Court in 2019, which ultimately said no, Syed stayed in prison. But last September, prosecutors asked to overturn his conviction. They uncovered a couple of new suspects and said key evidence was never given to Syed's lawyers. The judge, just a few days later, vacated Syed's conviction, released him from prison. Here he is walking out of court just moments after that decision. You probably remember, we covered it here on this show, it was big news. A free man now, for the first time in decades. A month later, every charge against him was dropped. But this March, an appellate court in Maryland reinstated Syed's conviction. Why? Well, the victim's brother said his rights were violated because he wasn't able to be at that hearing in 2022. That brings us all up to today, where Syed's attorneys showed up in court to fight it. Let's bring in NBC's legal analyst, Angela Senadella. So talk to us about where this is headed. There's no chance Syed goes back to prison for this murder. This is not about his guilt or innocence, right? It's about the victim's family here, and we heard from them today. Listen. This is extremely painful as you say, and this is an ongoing living memory to Hay. Justice should be served in this case. There has been a terrible injustice here. Where does this go, Angela? Hallie, yeah, so you do have so much compassion for the victim's family always, but you're exactly right. This is not about innocence and guilt at this point. The defendant is essentially stuck in this procedural no-man's land, and he can't be stuck in this purgatory forever. So at this point, it appears the Supreme Court will either reverse the conviction, as was as would happen initially, and keep him out of prison forever, or they will likely just repeat this hearing and finally give the victim's family a chance to speak in person at the hearing. But note here, the prosecution and the defense want the same thing. Everybody wants this conviction to be vacated. So that's what's going to happen. Angela Senadella, thank you very much. A lot of folks watching that one. Appreciate it.
Up next, some breaking news we're just getting in about some apparently made-up donations connected to a very controversial congressman. Our Tom Winter will join us live. Then that big writer strike may be over, but the lead writers on a popular daytime show are still not coming back. What Drew Barrymore, Barrymore's team has to say in our five things. Plus, how an armed man managed to get into Wisconsin's capital, demanding to see the governor not once, but twice. More on that in just a minute. We are hearing today from the Wisconsin governor after somebody illegally brought a gun into the state capitol demanding to see him and then incredibly came back two hours later with an assault rifle. The governor was not in the building at the time, but here's what he had to say not long before we came on the air. The Capitol Police took control of the situation and uh, uh, and so it's, it's over. But yeah, it's always something that um, is things you don't want to see happen. So some context here. Guns are actually allowed in the state capitol in Madison if they're concealed and the person has a valid permit. But this person's gun was visible. It was in a holster. So he was arrested. He posted bail, came back with the assault rifle, was taken into custody again, and then taken to the hospital. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now. What happened here? How did this happen? And do we know anything about the suspect here? Mr. Halley, a couple more details that are, are, are bizarre, frankly, around these circumstances. Officials from the state of Wisconsin say that when this man approached the governor's office in the Wisconsin state capitol, he apparently was shirtless. You mentioned he had a holstered handgun, and officials say he also had a leashed dog. He demanded to see the governor, and as you mentioned, he was arrested, his weapon taken away. And then hours later, the man had, according to officials, bailed himself out of jail, and hours later, he came back to the Capitol's exterior. This time, he had a loaded AK-47-style rifle, and authorities say that when police uh, did a search of his backpack, they then found what is being described as a collapsible police-style baton, and it is illegal, officials say, for him to have had that because he did not have a permit for concealed carry of that weapon. So he then later on, according to officials, was taken uh, into custody for a psychiatric evaluation. So this is an hours long series of events. We're told the governor was not at the Capitol at the time of this Halley. And another uh, point to bring up, there are no metal detectors at the state Capitol. Mm. It's not the first time that, the, that we've seen, you know, a potential threat against a public official here, not even in Wisconsin. Is there any indication that the security footprint is going to change at the Capitol or around the governor himself? Yeah, no immediate changes as far as we know, Hallie. And the governor was asked about this earlier. Here's part of what he said. I never, ever talk about what uh, my security uh, detail does or what they're planning on doing. Uh, but anytime something like this happens, obviously they reevaluate. Now, as you mentioned, this is not the first time there have been threats, including against uh, Governor Evers. In 2022, last year, his name was allegedly part of a hit list that also included Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who, of course, has uh, faced a series of threats, and there were multiple trials surrounding the alleged threats to that governor. Hallie? Jesse Kirsch, thank you very much for that reporting. We've got to get to some news just breaking into us in the last couple of minutes here. Some new court documents showing that a former staffer for Congressman George Santos's campaign is admitting to essentially disguising donations from Santos' family members as donations coming from other people. It's all part of her guilty plea on federal charges. This indictment against the treasurer also claims that hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations were hidden like this. NBC's Tom Winter is following this. Can you help us put it into plain English? Because it sounds a lot like this <laughs> the, the, a whole bunch of money may have been made up and then federally reported. Yeah, the allegation is pretty simple and, and uh, alludes to just what you said, Hallie. It was all a fake. That's what federal prosecutors are saying. That's what she's pleading guilty to. We're talking about Nancy Marks, the former campaign treasurer for Congressman George Santos, the Republican from Long Island, who is not identified by name in the criminal information, but there's only one person who's been elected to Congress from the 3rd District of New York. So it's clearly him, according to the filings. And what they said is twofold. There, there are essentially two elements to this scheme. The primary goal of this was to meet certain thresholds for the Republican National Committee for the Santos committee to then get money and logistical support from them. And if they showed that they had a certain amount of third party donors or a loan from Santos, they would be able to qualify for those types of perks, the funding, the cash, the logistics that happened with it. So, Hallie, the focus here was effectively on two fronts. 
One, they made up donors to make it seem like they got enough money at the uh, year end of 2021. And the second component of this is that Santos loaned his campaign half a million dollars when, according to the documents and what Ms. Marks pleaded guilty to, he didn't even have the money to do that mm. at the time. So it was essentially all a fake, prosecutors say. Any response from Team Santos on this one yet? Uh, so far not, but uh, we'll continue to look at the phones, the texts, and the emails and see what we get. It's where you live. Tom Winter, thank you so much. Appreciate <laughs> it. it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the Pentagon says the military has shot down an armed Turkish drone that came really close to U.S. troops in Syria. It is very rare to see something like this, where one NATO member uses force against another. The Pentagon says it doesn't have any indication that Turkey tried to target U.S. forces. Number two, officials say more than 3,000 people have been forced to evacuate from one of Spain's Canary Islands because of a wildfire. Remember that one on Tenerife back in August, one of its worst wildfires in decades? It was never totally put out. All these little fires have kept popping up. This particular one is in the same spot where the last one happened. Remember, these islands are dealing with really intense drought and very high temperatures. Number three, to an NBC News exclusive now, a woman suing Jason Derulo the singer, accusing him of sexual harassment and aggressive behavior. She says after she signed a deal with him, he expected sex. According to the lawsuit, her team reached out to Derulo's manager and Atlantic Records, and she was later dropped. Derulo's manager and an Atlantic Records rep did not immediately reply to our request for comment. Number four sources are telling NBC News that Drew Barrymore's three head writers are not coming back to her show right now, although they didn't say exactly why. Remember the whole flip-flop here, um, her show, there was this question, was it going to come back during the strike, the Drew Barrymore show? The show is apparently interviewing writers and plans to return October 16th. Number five, take a look at these guys, look at them. Lima, Peru, the country's first leopard cubs born in captivity. The zoo says it's working to preserve a whole bunch of species. This one is considered vulnerable. God, they're so cute. They don't have names yet. There's gonna be a contest to figure out what to call them. I mean, we need a baby leopard cub cam. Would you watch that all day? Oh, I would. Adorable. A new study is out tonight that doctors hope could lead to some new treatments for autism, which, as you probably know, affects one in every 36 Americans. Scientists in Stanford spent a decade on this, right? This is 10 years in the making. They simulated brain development that found that dozens of genes interfere with various steps in development, and that's what could lead to autism. They were able to figure out a way to test all these genes together, like 400 of them. Dr. Kavita Patel is joining us now. This is a report in the journal Nature that goes deep into research. Help us lift out of that, bottom line it for us, right? This is a significant step forward. What does it mean in a practical matter? It is, and you talked about just autism. It's something that probably every single one of us knows someone because one in 36 people have the diagnosis. Autism isn't just this one disease. We believe it's a spectrum of right. diseases. But Hallie, the big thing is that over the last decade, it's been about 74, one in 74, that had it. So this genetic research shows us that it's much more complicated than we thought and that, in fact, in the fetal cells and development, potentially even in utero, utero when the brain is developing in a, in a fetus, that there are genes that knock things on and off and can interact with each other and can also increase the chances of other diseases that we see with autism. Is there any takeaway to it? The takeaway, I think, is that we now know that it's much more complicated, like all things, than okay. we thought, and that we also need to be kind of cognizant that the genetic factors are not the only factors, that there's also these other life factors that we need more research around. But we see, autism's, we see autism as kind of sitting in the spectrum, and along with other diseases like ep uh, epilepsy and seizure disorders, we see these associations, and we've always wondered as doctors, why is this happening? Now we know there's probably some genetic triggers that work with each other and make that worse. And on the alternative, can sometimes, if that gene is turned off, and Hallie, this is where it's very cool, we now can do things with CRISPR, a technology right. that edits genes, that can potentially be a, a source of treatment and identifying those genes early on and potentially turning off that interaction. So very important for treatment, mm. very important if you're a parent or if you have a diagnosis of autism yourself, this could lead to some breakthroughs in the following years. What about for pregnancy. You talk about fetal development. Pregnancy. Is there any indication right. that, the, that right. any behavioral changes will make a difference? It's a great question. And I think that's why people want to augment this 10 years of research from Stanford with kind of the environment that we have pregnant women and even young babies in. So I think this is all going to be very important. It's probably going to teach us a lot more about, you know, we all worry about when we're pregnant, are we doing the right things? Are we not doing the right things? I think this is just going to give us more information, potentially even more genetic testing that we had when we were pregnant with our blood to understand if those genes are 
are expressed in our fetuses, and that can be important. It's fascinating. Yeah. As you say, a significant breakthrough. Yeah. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you thank so you. much. Good to see you. Coming up tonight, some concerns over what could happen to the water supply around New Orleans with this salt water that they don't want heading up the Mississippi. Plus, the pretty bananas chase for a rogue primate on the loose for hours. We're going to sh we'll show you in the local. New Orleans mayor tonight out with an emergency declaration because of this salt water we've told you about making its way from the Gulf of Mexico up the Mississippi River, and that is potentially a massive problem for the drinking water in this area. The Army Corps of Engineers today is adjusting its timeline for when they think this could have an impact on New Orleans, saying they built an underwater barrier that's bought them a little more time. So we were thinking maybe as soon as the end of this month. Now that's pushed back a bit. But if you're not in or around New Orleans, other parts of the state could see the impact in the next few days. Some spots are already dealing with it. It's happening because of a number of factors, including the drought. There's not enough water flowing down the Mississippi River to push the salt water out. Here's Sam Brock with more. Hatley, I'm in the city of New Orleans right now, next to the Mississippi River. As we know, the, the mayor of New Orleans had declared a state of emergency with officials not just in Orleans Parish, but all over the region, having no idea if they have days or weeks right now to get preparations in order for clean drinking water. That salt water intrusion is happening, and it's happening south of where I'm standing, not that far, maybe a 45-minute drive at most, because you have historically low levels on the Mississippi River. Doesn't necessarily look that way when you just sort of glance at it, but it is based on the, on the flows of the water. They are not strong enough right now to push denser salt water from the Gulf of Mexico back out into the Gulf. Now, the question that everyone wants to know is, how long will it take to progress all the way to New Orleans to the population center we have about a million people in the greater region, half a million of which are in Jefferson Parish. And everyone right now is trying a combination of things to get ready. Piping, we saw that in Jefferson, where they have 15 miles linking upstream to an area that's unaffected by the higher levels of salt. And they're taking that water and bringing it in for their treatment plants. Certainly, public officials have been disseminating bottled water, although that is very much uh, available at all the local supermarkets that we saw, barging all sorts of different techniques being used right now. We also got to go out earlier today with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This was pretty fascinating. They're constructing a sill, which is basically an underwater barrier where they use this giant drill, take river sediment, move it over, and stack it on top of an existing wall, and it blocks, for the most part, the salt water. But it doesn't provide a permanent solution. This is really just temporary. We spoke with someone from the Army Corps of Engineers about specifically what they need right now. Here's what he told me. All levels of government are throwing everything we have at this problem. And uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the silver bullet is rain. We, we, need, we need rain upstream. As far as a, a specific timeline here, what we are told from officials is it just changed with kind of some comforting news. There's no guarantees here. But the reality is that right now, the latest projections, which they call a forecast of a forecast of a forecast, is that it will only reach the salt water Gretna, perhaps in a month and a half, and St. Bernard, which is on the doorstep of New Orleans, but not near the two largest water intakes, which would be close to a best case scenario in, in this instance. But the farther that this salt water intrusion or wedge goes, the more people that are impacted. The good news right now, again, it's not expected to reach at this point in time all the way to New Orleans, but it could be thousands upon thousands more people. It's been stuck in the same place, according to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, by that silt for about 13 days now. How long will it hold? That is the question. Back to you. Sure is. Our thanks to Sam Brock for that reporting. NBC News covers hundreds of other stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the man who shot and hurt 10 people on a subway in New York has been sentenced to life in prison. Frank James had already pleaded guilty to terror charges in that shooting last April. He fired at least 33 shots and set off smoke grenades before going on the run. James was given 10 life sentences, plus 10 years. Out of our Southeast Bureau, invasive snails have invaded a North Carolina town. <laughs> These are apple snails. They're originally from South America, but they're now popping up along a river in Lumberton in North Carolina. A biologist found adult snails and then clusters of bright pink eggs. The problem is they're toxic, potentially deadly to people, and they're bad for plants. Local leaders say if you see one of these snails, you live around Lumberton, go ahead and report it. They're pretty, uh, pretty distinctive looking. Also distinctive looking, 
of our Midwest Bureau, this pet monkey going MIA in Indianapolis. This is Momo, and that's Momo's owner after Momo's on the loose for a few hours. Momo's a patas monkey, the fastest on earth. Police actually uh, were familiar with Momo, He'd gone missing also in July. He's now getting checked out by the Indianapolis Zoo. Not every day you see that in your neighborhood. Up next, one of the most popular items at the grocery store that's usually one of the cheapest is hitting record high prices. And why it may not be coming down anytime soon. But first, the new investigation into Abercrombie and Fitch. Looking into its ex-CEO as he faces allegations of sex abuse. That's coming up. Abercrombie and Fitch tonight hiring a law firm to look into allegations of sex abuse against its former CEO. The allegations, originally published by the BBC, accuse Mike Jeffries of exploiting young men and recruiting them for sex parties. At least some of the parties are alleged to have happened while Jeffries was head of, obviously, Abercrombie, the big clothing company. They announced Jeffries' retirement in 2014 after 22 years. A spokesman tonight telling NBC News the company was appalled and disgusted by the allegations. Jeffrey's lawyer declined to comment to NBC. No criminal charges have been filed. Maura Barrett is joining us now. Help us understand some of the allegations here and what the company might be looking for in this investigation since Jeffrey's not even in the job. He's been out of the job for almost a decade. That's right, Hallie. It has been quite some time, and it is important to note that there have been no criminal charges filed just yet. This investigation just coming to light with this BBC reporting this week. And basically, it lays out that they spoke to 12 men alleging that they were involved in organizing uh, and planning and attending these sex parties. And some of these men say that they felt exploited, uh, and some even uh, created claim or said had claims of abuse. And so they're speaking out about this now. The BBC he spoke with several of them on the record and on camera. And as you noted, uh, Jeffrey's uh, attorney declined to comment, but he also noted that Jeffrey's, in general, has a practice of not commenting on personal matters. Uh, and this is, a prof this is a question of professional. So that's why they said that they're declining to comment. But it's important to also note uh, that at the same time, just before Jeffrey's left Abercrombie and Fitch, there, there are allegations uh, that there were legal settlements over, quote, misconduct claims. Now, we don't know if this is tied to these sex parties, if any of these people involved overlap, but it is something to po important to point out, especially considering uh, that the company is saying that they were surprised and appalled and disgusted, as you laid out. Now, the BBC is sticking by their reporting, pointing to the fact that several of these men are on the record. They also say that they did e extensive corroboration fact-checking over the last two years, a two-year investigation, talking with dozens of sources, as well as housekeepers uh, they have a that were that were involved in the parties. Um, they also did a lot of cross-checking with uh, flight tickets, um, because all of this apparently happened across the world in major cities. And so this is something they're sticking by, and clearly some very serious allegations that Jeffries is facing right now, Hallie. Maura Barrett, thank you very much. Listen, if you've gone shopping for chicken lately, you've probably noticed it is getting more expensive. In fact, some new numbers out show the price for a pound of chicken record high, up 4% from last year. More than that, actually. It's almost $2 a pound for a whole chicken. And more people want chicken, too. For the first time ever, people are expected to eat 100 pounds of chicken on average. So a hunger for it, even though companies are producing less of it. Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver, our economic analyst, is joining us now. Man, like, we were hoping we were over some of this inflation stuff, eggs were really expensive, but... Chicken is costing a lot of money for people who are buying it, right? So if all these people want to eat it, why are companies cutting back the supply? Yeah, well, you said 100 pounds per person on average in this country. We do eat a lot of chicken, but believe it or not, the forecasts were even for more consumption this year based on what they saw last year, the big chicken producers, Tyson, Purdue, Cargo Foods. It's just that demand has not been as strong this year, so they've actually cut production. And in the case of Tyson Foods, they've closed six plants, laid off 4,700 workers. They got freezers full of chicken that's not even come to the market yet. But the other po uh, protein prices are high, too. Beef prices and pork prices. When those prices are up, chicken is the next choice, usually, for people when they want to get their protein. That's why those prices are high. 100 pounds of chicken per year, um, same can't be said for meat and pork, uh, like meaning beef, right? Like, why is that? 
Yeah, because we're eating less and less beef and pork as a country. You see more of that happening in places like China, where pork consumption is very high. But we're eating less and less of that protein. Last year was a banner year, a bull market, you could call it, for protein prices. It's just that the producers thought that would continue into this year. It really hasn't, and that's why you have this oversupply. So they're cutting supply now, holding it back to raise prices. And since those other prices for beef, again, and pork are so high, that flows down to chicken prices. Consumption makes a big difference here. But that's why you're seeing the high prices. They'll probably be with us through the rest of the year, at least. Caleb Silver, uh, not necessarily the news folks wanted to hear. Thank you very much for that. Coming up in tonight's original hour, Gotti Schwartz, ice bathing in the name of science to see if biohacking his body can keep him young forever. And sending me this video while he was out in the field. I'm just in the hyperbaric chamber for you, Hallie. This is going to be a really funny story. Are you not entertained? He's going to join us in just a second. Don't miss it. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And listen, there's a lot of people who are looking to figure out what exactly is the fountain of youth. How can they keep their bodies at peak performance at all times? For some of these folks, it's about taking matters into their own hands, right? The idea of biohacking, hacking your own biology. It can get pretty expensive and kind of extreme. So is it for everyone? NBC's Gotti Schwartz takes a look. It's a health craze taking over the internet with over 700 million views on TikTok, hashtag biohacking or hacking your body, which some will think will create a better version of yourself. Everything from wearable tech to diet shifts, gene analysis, it's the do-it-yourself approach to health, but the DIY lifestyle can be a little lonely, so why not do it together? And that's what brings me to Remedy Place, looking for the fountain of youth on Sunset Boulevard. So we're a whole entire club center on self-care, but with a social twist. Here you can breathe your way into the six minute ice bath oh, club. Good, control the breath, relax the shoulders. How once wide awake. Healing has never felt so it. cool. How about a little relaxing in the hyperbaric chambers? Okay. Meant to help increase your oxygen intake to speed up your body's healing process. I feel pretty good. What's not so relaxing? The price tag of $2,500 a month, which gets an all access membership. Cryotherapy, cupping, acupuncture, lymphatic massages, automatic foam rollers, vitamin IV drips, and more. The effectiveness of many of these treatments often unclear. For example, those vitamin IV drips, a large review of medical literature shows no clear results for those with major issues, let alone for healthy people, where it's often compared to simple hydration. But Dr. Leary, a chiropractor and founder of The Remedy Place, says the idea is about finding healthier ways to socialize meeting spot, after work hangout instead of a happy hour. Here's how he reframes the booming trend. We don't biohack, we remedy. Because there is no shortcuts with your health. The global biohacking industry, valued at nearly $17 billion last year and is projected to reach more than $80 billion by 2031. And for extreme biohackers, it is not cheap. Take 46-year-old biohacking millionaire Brian Johnson, who I met up with earlier this year. He says he spends about $2 million a year trying to be 18 again basically aging backwards. Well, we're trying to basically measure every single organ in the entire body, and then we're trying to rejuvenate the age. Which means some extremes. He takes over 100 pills a day, wears a tiny contraption on, well, his other Johnson to monitor nighttime erections. He even injected his son's plasma in him, something which he stopped doing after he said had no benefits. Johnson says everyone doesn't have to follow his exact move, but they can use it as a guide, which a lot of people do. Teresa Skrobonik's goal was simple, live longer and look younger. I came from a family that never took care of themselves, smoked two, three packs of cigarettes a day, and they all died early. And so I thought, I'm going to do the exact opposite. She started taking handfuls of supplements and prescriptions, but they didn't have the impact she wanted. I felt worse than I did before I took it. I started getting headaches. I was taking naps twice a day. The obsession impacting her mentally. I wasn't really living. I was living to take the pills so later I could live. Now she cautions people, emphasizing working with your doctor and knowing what your body needs. I started using my body and my diet and started just doing the things I was deficient in, and I just feel a lot better. Back at Remedy Place, they're not hesitating to jump in and try to rethink health. There, go. there is no quick fix. That's because you're repairing. Mm -hmm. You're not anti-aging. 
Aging is inevitable, but doing it as best you can, that's priceless. Fresh off his ice bath is Gotti Schwartz joining us now live. <laughs> and Gotti, like, I am glad you talked about the, the idea of how effective is this actually, right? Because there is a very tiny slice of, I think, the American people who can actually afford to do this, even if it were to work. And that's still a big question mark here, right? That's a huge question mark. And so the place that we went to, Remedy Place, the pitch is this. It's, it's a place that you can go on a date. And I was like, wait, people are going to bring a date to an ice bath? And they said, yeah, well, you know, you go to a bar, you spend a bunch of money on booze, and you're killing brain cells during that night if you're drinking a lot. Here you come and you spend a bunch of money, and instead you're doing things that are better for your body. I got to say, that ice bath, I was like, this is the worst first date idea ever. <laughs> when that. I went in. <laughs> but then after, Hallie, after you get out of the ice bath, all you want to do is, like, hug and get warm. So I don't know. I mean, if you make it through the ice bag, maybe it's genius. Uh, again, the efficacy, I, I have no idea. All I know is that that night that I took that ice bath and then did the hyperbaric chamber, I track all my sleep, and that was the one night that I got, like, an hour and a half of the deep sleep, allegedly, according to my, my watch here. So uh, maybe it was because I was freezing cold for a while and I didn't sure. warm up for another two hours. Uh, or maybe it was something else. Uh, but they say that this is just about finding healthy alternatives to socialization uh, as opposed to going out on the town with your friends. Listen, z zero judgment. We're a, we're a zero judgment show here, right? And like the romance aspect aside here, like, it, and I'm not asking to be facetious, is there any functional difference between like an ice bath, just as an example, and just like taking a cold shower at your house for a little while? Uh, that's a that's a big question, and, and actually, the ice bath, in terms of the things that they offered at this place, the Remedy Place, is probably the cheapest, easiest thing that you could do at home. Ice bath is ice cubes in a bath. Most people have access to that, yeah. and they say that there are health benefits and that everybody should do that. Then they've got the cryo chamber that they say that's actually right. didn't get uh, as cold or make your body get as cold as it is in the ice bath. But then they do have some very uh, technical pieces of equipment. One of the things that they showed cost like $32,000. They said it was FDA approved, yeah. and it gave you this massage to clean out your system. I only did those two for you, Hallie. I draw the line after ice bath, but I'm I'm going to have to go back and, and be a guinea pig because there's nothing I won't do for you. <laughs> I was just going to say, man, and uh, the, the text from inside the hyperbaric chamber, thank you for letting us show that to the, to the people, a little glimpse into, sure. into what our life is like. Gotti Schwartz, um, amazing yeah. reporting. Thank you so much. We will look for more from you. Uh, watch Gotti. Stay tuned now tonight, 8 Eastern, here on NBC News. Now, do not miss it. That does it for us this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air with the White House on defense. President Biden saying he will not stop construction on a new border wall, even though he kind of promised the opposite on the campaign trail. What changed and why he says he had no other choice. Plus, new moves from former President Trump tonight to try to toss out the case against him in Washington. Why he says his time in the White House should protect him from prosecution and whether that could actually work. Then, the man whose case inspired the Serial podcast is back in court again today, but not to decide whether he's innocent or guilty of murder. Why the victim's family says their rights were violated. Plus, the latest from Wisconsin's governor after an armed man went looking for him at the state capitol. What we're learning right now about the latest potential threat to a public official. And an emergency declaration in New Orleans tonight why officials say salt water could contaminate the drinking water for more than a million people. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and as we've been on the air, the Secretary of State is in Mexico City as we speak, saying the scale and the scope of the border crisis right now is unprecedented, as the Biden administration is coming under pressure from Democrats to address this big surge of migrants coming into this country. Listen. The scale of this challenge demands that we redouble our efforts, that we do more to improve and modernize border security, that we do more to increase legal migration pathways and protections, more to address root causes, and more to deter irregular migration, humanely. It's coming as President Biden is acknowledging that his administration will let more border wall get built. That's a difference from what he said before. They're waiving some two dozen federal laws that would open the door to building more of that in Texas. 
The White House saying this huge reversal has nothing to do with that pressure from fellow Democrats, like leaders in New York and Chicago, who have been sounding the alarm about how many migrants are heading into their cities, overwhelming the resources they say they have. Here's President Biden earlier, essentially saying his hands are tied. The border wall, the money was appropriated for the border wall. I tried to get them to reappropriate, to redirect that money. They didn't. They wouldn't. And in the meantime, there's nothing under the law other than they have to use the money for what was appropriate. I can't stop that. Do you believe the border wall works? No. Now, if you're saying to yourself, wait a second, I thought President Biden was against building the border wall. You would be correct. He spent a lot of time on the 2020 campaign trail promising to do the opposite here. Listen. There will not be another foot of wall constructed on my administration. Not another foot of wall, but this is where we stand today. It's all part of a broader border battle, of course, not just about the wall, but about the river separating Texas from Mexico. With the Justice Department today saying Texas broke the law by putting this controversial thousand foot buoy barrier in the river. But Texas, run by Republicans, of course, is saying it's allowed to do it. It doesn't need permission from the feds because the construction is not permanent. These buoys are temporary. They are designed to be tactical and moved. And that does not create the type of long term obstruction that your honor is pointing to in Rio Grande. Ali Rafa is joining us now from outside the White House. So, Ali, help us understand the, the calculation here from the Biden administration. They're essentially saying it sounds like that their back is up against the wall when it comes to the wall here. Talk us through it. Yeah, Hallie. Well, how much of a change this is, is coming down to really who you ask. If you ask those of us who covered President Biden as a 2020 candidate and who have covered him throughout his presidential term so far, yes, this is a major reversal uh, by a president who, as a candidate and throughout his presidency so far, has vowed to discontinue the immigration policies of his predecessor, former President Trump. But if you ask the White House, they're separating what they want to do versus what they say they have to to do. They're saying that their hands are tied, that they have to use these funds that were allocated by Congress in 2019 under the Trump administration to be used for the building of more border wall. And as DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, who is actually in Mexico right now, uh, issued a statement a short time ago trying to clear up uh, what he says uh, is his comments being taken out of context. He says in part, quote, there is new, no new administration policy with respect to border walls from day one. This administration has made clear that a border wall is not the answer. That remains our position, and our position has never wavered. He goes on to say that his comments uh, calling the situation at the border, uh, quote, acute and immediate need to build more border barriers. He says that's being taken out of context, and he stresses again that there is no change in policy. And even though the White House is saying that this change wasn't made because of pressure, as you mentioned in the intro there, from Democratic allies of the president, it is notable that their criticisms and their calls for help have sharpened recently as they grow more and more desperate for more resources as we continue to see the numbers of migrants crossing the border reach historic and record highs, Hallie. And even before the news today, this issue has become a somewhat of a political liability for the president. You think of how much time has been uh, taken up from uh, Republicans during these primary debates talking about the border, how they've fundraised off of this. So uh, no matter whether this news came today or not, this is definitely an issue uh, that the Biden White House has been and, and uh, honestly should be worried about leading into 2024. Allie, real quickly here, where do things stand as it relates to that really controversial buoy barrier in the river there? Any movement with this latest flurry of legal challenges? Yeah, well, today, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the state of Texas is saying that the Biden administration does not have a right to order uh, the state of Texas and Governor Greg Abbott to remove those border barriers, those buoys uh, along the border there. And we've seen our correspondents along the border cover that for weeks now and also cover uh, the, uh, the chain link fencing that has been cut by some of those migrants to be able to cross the border. So uh, this issue, along with these changes today, uh, really the outpouring of, of reaction to them just beginning, Hallie. Ali Rafa, thank you very much. We got a lot going on here in Washington, too, with so many people looking at the building just down the road from me here, the Capitol, with pieces falling into place to set up what could be a tense fight amongst Republicans less than a week from now in this battle over who's going to be the next Speaker of the House after Kevin McCarthy was ousted. And here's your wild card. You're looking at him. 
a wild card by the name of Donald Trump. That's because sources are telling us he's potentially considering a visit to the Capitol next week. It'd be his first visit to the Capitol grounds since January 6th. With the Republican lawmaker telling us Mr. Trump wants to come and, I'm quoting here, unify the party ahead of the speakership election. It's coming to some new comments from the former president in just the last hour, suggest that he would be open to being the Speaker of the House himself for a short period, he says, if necessary, he says. I want to bring in now our Capitol Hill correspondent, Garrett Hake, who happens to also cover the Donald Trump beat. Uh, Garrett, a real nexus for you right here. So a couple of questions. How serious is this? And would he even have the votes to be Speaker for a short period of time? And I should preface by saying, technically, the rules say you don't have to be a member of the House of Representatives to be Speaker. That's why this conversation is even happening. Hallie, I think it's serious that he is talking about coming here to try to involve himself in these conversations, but I don't think it is serious or realistic to think that he would ever become the speaker, uh, even on a short-term basis. And part of the reason why is Donald Trump does lots of things to Republicans, but what he doesn't do is unify them. He is a singularly divisive presence in American politics, even among elected Republicans. And I can't think of anything that would put more pressure on moderate and mm. institutionalist Republicans like those who represent Joe Biden districts to act quickly to select anybody else as speaker than the prospect of if they don't, Donald Trump would suddenly be the guy. And I think somebody who has a pretty good read on this might be Donald Trump's former vice president, Mike Pence, who got asked about it earlier today. Here's how he looks at this whole situation. I think there's enough talent in the Congress of the United States to find a principled conservative uh, who can lead this conference. And uh, But uh, I, I can't say I'm terribly surprised to see my former running mate injecting himself into this conversation. I think that's the key thing here, Hallie. This is the big political story in the country right. right now. It involves Republicans. And up until this moment, it didn't involve Donald Trump. He wasn't a player in this vote this week. Kevin McCarthy didn't call him and ask for help. His, his endorsement didn't matter. Look, the last speaker, Kevin McCarthy, never endorsed formally Donald Trump for president. I will guarantee you the next one will. But I don't think Donald Trump's going to be that speaker. It, it, you make a very important point here, right? We talk about the spectrum of where Republicans are here. We've talked about that a lot in the last 72 hours, the sort of so-called Republican rebels, most of them on this end mm -hmm. of the spectrum, in very safe districts. They're not at risk, right? If they oust Kevin McCarthy or vote for Donald Trump for speaker, they're getting voted back in, most likely based on where the numbers are. Very different scenario on the other end of the spectrum, right? As you point out, for some of these more vulnerable Republicans here, um, who, who could be up against it? if then the person who they're running against says, well, wait a second, you voted for Donald Trump to be speaker even if it was for just a month. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, if you're Mike Lawler or Anthony D'Esposito, two of those new Republican congressmen from New York State, the majority makers, right, who helped put Republicans because in the majority. That's, that's right. Right. Could, I mean, like, that's a piece of it. They have no wiggle room. They can't they lose. They have no yeah. wiggle room. They need to be independent of Donald Trump. They need to be against Joe Biden. But they sure don't want to be associated with the speakership of Donald Trump. And, Hallie, by the way, even one of those rebels, Nancy Mace, represents the Charleston area in South Carolina, one of the swingier areas in that state. She doesn't want Donald Trump to be the speaker. I mean, this is not a winning proposition for them. It's telling that the two people who are most in favor of this, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Troy Nails of Texas, mm -hmm. who's probably most famous to our viewers to be the guy who's always smoking cigars when we interview him outside, but he's the one who formally introduced this idea of inviting Donald Trump. He's tweeted today about the idea that Trump could somehow, you know, he's getting a lot of interest in this. Yeah. Interest is one thing. Votes behind closed doors uh, to be the nominee of the party to actually represent them as speaker are, is a whole other thing. Generous interpretation of the word famous as it relates to that, but I take your point, Garrett. Really quickly here, though, even setting the speaker race aside, merely the appearance of Donald Trump on Capitol Hill, the optics of that next week, if it were to happen, would be significant. Yeah, absolutely. Donald Trump has not been here since he was president. He certainly hasn't been here since January 6th. There's already been a number of Democrats who've commented on the idea that the last time there was some kind of rally for Donald Trump uh, here on Capitol grounds, it didn't go very well. So, um, no, I don't think he would be especially welcome on this side of the Capitol, the Senate side. Uh, you know, I think it would be an enormously divisive moment, once again, to have him injecting himself into uh, the legislative process in this way. Garrett Hake, uh, the, the beat collision that you have faced so often uh, in the last few months happening again today. Thank you, friend. Appreciate it. One of the issues feeling a lot of the tension here in Washington right now, right, as it relates to not just the speaker battle, is money for Ukraine.
Should America keep the faucet running to help that country against the invasion of Russia here? Right now, you've got Secretary of State Blinken, as we told you at the top of the show. He is speaking from Mexico. He's been one of the faces of the Biden administration's effort to keep that money flowing. All of it coming as Ukraine is seeing one of its deadliest attacks on civilians since the start of the war. You are looking at some video here uh, of what happened after the Ukrainians said a Russian missile came down on a village, accounting for more than a sixth of the people who live there, killing so many, more than roughly 50. These are the scenes of body after body getting pulled from the rubble. Buildings in every direction leveled. NBC's Raf Sanchez is following the latest for us. So let's start with the attack here and what it says about the overall strategy, Raf. And then I want to get into sort of the political implications of funding. But let's start with what's going on on the ground. Yeah, Holly, so in terms of this attack, the death toll continues to rise, but this is already the deadliest Russian strike on Ukrainian civilians this year, and it's one of the deadliest strikes in the entire war. Here's what we know. This Russian missile, according to Ukrainian officials, fell on a village called Haroza. It's in Kharkiv in northeast Ukraine. It's about 30 miles behind the front lines, Holly. There is no evidence at all that there was any legitimate military targets in this area, and as you said, the scale of the loss of life is just staggering. This is a village of 300 people, 51 of whom were killed in this strike. Among the dead is a three-year-old, excuse me, a six-year-old boy. Now, Kharkiv has been through just unspeakable horror over the course of this war, especially in the early days, but this has really, really shaken this region. Authorities there have declared three days of mourning. In terms of the bigger picture, Hallie, it shows you Vladimir Putin's forces are continuing to strike civilian areas mm -hmm. as they continue to be unable to defeat the Ukrainians on the battlefield. How anxious are Ukrainian officials, Raf, based on the reporting we have about the conversations happening in Washington about whether or not to continue providing Ukraine with the monetary help that it says it so desperately needs? Yeah, they're really concerned. As you know, Hallie, this 45-day continuing resolution to keep the government open does not include funding for Ukraine, and officials from President Zelensky on downwards are keeping a very, very close eye on what's happening where you are in D.C. Zelensky was in Spain earlier, and he talked about his interpretation of what's going on in Washington. Take a listen. I think it's too late for us to worry. I think we have to work on it. Difficult um, election period for, for, for the United States, different voices. Some of the voices are very strange. Some of the voices are very strange, says the president of Ukraine. For what it's worth, Halle, Zelensky was in D.C. last month. He says he is confident that there is a base rock of support in the U.S. Mm -hmm. for the Ukrainian cause. Halle. Raf Sanchez, we're glad to have you on this story for us tonight. Thanks. We are hearing today from the Wisconsin governor after somebody illegally brought a gun into the state capitol, demanding to see him, and then came back two hours later with an assault rifle. Now, the governor wasn't there at the time. He was not in the building, but not long before we got on the air, he talked about it. He was asked about it. Here's what he said. The Capitol Police took control of the situation, and uh, uh, and so it's, it's over. But, yeah, it's always something that um, is things you don't want to see happen. Some context here. Guns are allowed in the state capitol there in Madison if they're concealed, if the person has a valid permit. This person's gun was visible. It was in a holster. So he was arrested. He posted bail. He came back with the assault rifle, was taken into custody again, and then taken in the hospital. In just the last couple of minutes, we're hearing that the person who was arrested told police he was not a threat and that he was carrying a gun to defend himself. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now. What else do we know? Yeah, Hallie, uh, we know that at the time of this incident, according to officials, this man was shirtless. As you mentioned, uh, he walked into the state capitol, according to officials, went up to the governor's office and asked to speak with the governor, demanded to see the governor. And he were told that he had a holstered handgun and a leashed dog with him uh, because he was not legally able to openly carry in the state house. Uh, into the state capitol, uh, he was arrested, and then hours later, we're told, after he bailed himself out of jail, he then returned to the state capitol at the exterior of the building, and we're told that's when police approached him. He had a loaded AK-47-style rifle, and he also had, in a backpack, a police-style collapsible baton, and that's something he was not able to legally have concealed. And so uh, we're told that the weapons were taken away from him, and he received a psychiatric evaluation, Howie. 
Jesse Kirsch, thank you very much. Back here in Washington, the former president is today saying that presidential immunity should protect him from being prosecuted in the federal case against him over election interference in 2020, according to some new court filings. The whole thing is because his lawyers want the case thrown out. They're trying to get the whole thing dismissed. They say his push to try to stay in office even after losing was at the heart of his, what they call, official responsibilities as president. Remember, Mr. Trump was indicted by a federal grand jury back in August. And this is only the first in what's expected to be a whole series of motions in front of the judge before a key deadline coming up next week. Ken Delanian is joining us now. So, presidential immunity, it is not unexpected that the defense for Mr. Trump is trying to make this case. They're trying to do things to make sure that this case doesn't move forward, right? How likely is it that they'll succeed? Right, Hallie, we knew this was coming. Uh, legal experts say it's not likely, but it's not impossible. One said this is a moonshot, but not a crazy moonshot. And it's really a question of law, not of facts. So what's likely to happen is however this went, it would be appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. In the case, assuming the judge uh, in this case, Tanya Chutkin, does not grant this dismissal, um, it would be appealed after a potential conviction in this case. So we have a long way to go. But um, Donald Trump's lawyers have a couple of problems with this. One, there is no doctrine of presidential immunity from criminal prosecution. There's a civil case, or there's a case that says that pre presidents are immune from civil damages when they are operating as the president. Uh, but there's no precedent, obviously, for a president or a former president being charged with crimes. And so the, the Supreme Court would have to make new law on this. And then the other question would be, even if that argument won, were the things that Donald Trump was doing to try to overturn the election part of his presidential duties. His lawyers argue, oh, he was the president. He was interested in the integrity of the election. Jack Smith and the prosecutors would say what he was doing was a criminal conspiracy. He was trying to get himself uh, back into power improperly. That had nothing to do with governmental or presidential duties. So, uh, you know, that's going to those are the contours of the arguments. It's really, though, unlikely that Judge Tanya Chutkin, uh, who once said presidents are not kings, is going to grant this motion, Hallie. Ken Delaney, live for us there in Washington. Ken, thank you so much. We are learning in just the last hour or so that a tropical storm's outer bands are just now hitting Bermuda. We're talking about Philippe, expected to hit the island tomorrow and then head toward Maine. We're talking a lot of wind. You can see the track there. A lot of rain in northern New England. Meteorologist Bill Karens is watching this. How worried should people be about this one? Uh, minor power outages, the rain could cause some problems, and more than anything, it's another rainy weekend where a lot of people are going to be canceling their plans, especially in New England, maybe even mostly northern New England. So here's the latest in the Hurricane Center. It has 50 mile per hour winds. There's a huge shield of clouds here. This little area is Philippe, and then there's another kind of ocean storm out next to it, and all of this is going to head for New England. It's a messy storm. It's not like a clear cut, like tropical storm with an eye or a hurricane with an eye or anything like that. So the Hurricane Center actually has it becoming just like we call a post-tropical low, or almost like a nor'easter by the time we get to Saturday. So it's going to be kind of similar for Nova Scotia and for Maine, what we dealt with with Lee. But Lee was a little bit stronger. With Lee, we did have some wind gusts up to 80 miles per hour. This is exposed to be maybe max up to 60. So we had a lot of people lose power, about a quarter million in Nova Scotia and Maine with Lee. This one, the numbers should be much less. Here's our computer models. Almost everything is taking it up into Maine or Nova Scotia, but nothing is taking taking it towards New York or Boston or Long Island, for that matter. But a lot of rain is going to be thrown back into northern New England. Leaves are at their peak. They're going to be coming down with the wind and the rain. Uh, drains will be getting clogged, so we could have some localized flooding concerns. And we just don't need another rainy weekend. That's another one to three inches. The winds, the rule of thumb is once you get over about 40, 45, then you can start getting some tree branches coming down, especially if there's leaves on the trees. So we may have isolated power problems uh, from Provincetown all the way through the arm, the outer portion of the Cape. Uh, once we get to Saturday night into Sunday morning, this is when the strongest winds will hit Nova Scotia and down East Maine, maybe some gusts up to about 60. So the weekend forecast, 90 percent of the country, big thumbs up this weekend. It's actually going to be very enjoyable. The humidity is broken in many areas of the south, so Saturday looks great there. But from New York City northwards, it's another indoor Saturday with soggy conditions on and off all day long. Showers will linger in northern New England on Sunday, but if you have plans in D.C., Philly, New York, and Boston. Sunday is by far the better of your two weekend days. But look how nice it is, Hallie, from just about coast to coast. If you take the Northeast out of it, this would have been an A-plus weekend. It's going to be for me, uh, since I'll be in Florida. Bill Karens, <laughs> oh, thank you so just, much. Just poke the bear. Appreciate Thanks. you. Thank you, friend. Take care.
still ahead. A brand new study, pretty significant here. A huge breakthrough as it comes to understanding the development of autism. We're getting into findings that came after a decade of research, 10 years in the making. We'll be right back. The man whose case was made famous by the Serial podcast back in court today, arguing for justice for a murder he says he didn't commit, but spent more than two decades behind bars for. We look forward to hearing the court's decision, and we're hoping that in the end, you know, we'll have a chance to prove justice, not just for Hayes' family, but for our family as well. This all centers around the 1999 murder of Adnan Syed's former girlfriend, 18-year-old Heyman Lee. Police say they found evidence that indicated Syed committed the murder. In 2000, he was found guilty by a jury, sentenced to life in prison. Fast forward 14 years later, that's when Serial, that podcast, came out about the crime that uncovered some new evidence, poked holes in the case. You had tons of people listening to every development. Whatever the motivation is to kill someone, I had absolutely, it didn't exist in me. After the podcast aired, officials went back, they looked at everything, leading to this long back and forth over whether or not Syed should be allowed to have a new trial, going all the way to Maryland Supreme Court in 2019, which ultimately said no. So he stayed in prison until last September. That's when prosecutors asked to overturn his conviction. They uncovered two new suspects. They said key evidence was never given to Syed's lawyers. The judge ended up vacating his conviction just a few days later released him out of prison. Do you remember this moment? He's walking out of court moments after that decision. A free man here for the first time in decades. A month later, every charge against him was dropped. But this March, an appeals court in Maryland reinstated Syed's conviction. Why? The victim's brother said his rights were violated because he was not able to be at that hearing in 2022, last year. That brings us to today and this back and forth in court. Let's bring in NBC's legal analyst, Danny Savalos, who's joining us now. Talk to us about where this is headed. There's no chance, right, that Syed could go back to prison for this murder since this isn't about his guilt or innocence. This is about the victim's family. I want to play what, what uh, the lawyers of the Lee family said right after court today. This is extremely painful, as you say. And this is an ongoing living memory to Hay. Justice should be served in this case. There has been a terrible injustice here. So what does justice mean in this instance, Danny, and where does this go? This case is about the modern trend of victims' rights, something that didn't mean quite that much two or three decades ago. But now, uh, the modern trend is to recognize that victims, while they are not the clients of the prosecutor, Prosecutor does not need to listen to their wishes. Uh, it does not need to, uh, uh, excuse me, doesn't need to, I'm sorry. You lose me there? Uh, no, the we still got you, Danny. Yeah, yeah, the, the prosecution does not need to uh, listen to the, pro the, uh, the victims uh, necessarily, but this is about giving uh, a right to the victims to at least be heard, because that's all that can really happen in this case, is that the victims can be heard. Danny Savalos, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the late Senator Dianne Feinstein is being honored today at a private funeral in San Francisco. President Biden spoke over audio about Feinstein's life and legacy. Vice President Harris, you can see Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer also there. Feinstein died Friday at 90. Number two, I'm just into us in the last couple of minutes, the IRS says that Rudy Giuliani former President Trump's former personal attorney, apparently owes more than half a million dollars in federal taxes for the 2021 tax year. The IRS says it also has a lien on a property of his in Palm Beach, Florida, that he reportedly put up for sale recently. We've reached out to Giuliani's team. We're waiting for comment. Number three, new court documents show Congressman George Santos's former campaign treasurer is admitting to disguising donations in order to make the campaign seem more successful than it actually was. She is now pleading guilty to federal charges, the treasurer. She also said that both she and Santos lied in some reports they submitted, falsely claiming he loaned his campaign half a million dollars. Number four, a new study says people who use weight loss drugs similar to Ozempic and Wegovy could be at a higher risk of bad stomach problems. One of the things that these drugs do, remember, is slow down how quickly food goes through your stomach, so it makes you feel more full for a longer time, but that could also cause some GI issues. Researchers say severe stomach problems are rare, but they can happen, and that it's important for people to know what they're getting into. 
Number five, sources are telling NBC News that Drew Barrymore's three head writers may not be coming back to her show for now, although they didn't say exactly why. Remember, this was a whole thing during the writer's strike because there was a question of whether her show, the Drew Barrymore show, was going to come back at that time. The show is now apparently interviewing writers, plans to return October 16th. A new study is out tonight that doctors hope could lead to new treatment for autism, which affects, remember, about one in every 36 Americans. Scientists at Stanford had this research about a decade in the making. They spent 10 years working on this. They simulated brain development and found that dozens of genes interfere with key steps in development, and that could be one of the things that leads to autism. They were able to figure out a way to test all of these genes together, like 400 of them. Dr. Kavita Patel is joining us now. This is a report in the journal Nature that goes deep into research. Help us lift out of that, bottom line it for us, right? This is a significant step forward. What does it mean in a practical matter? It is, and you talked about just autism. It's something that probably every single one of us knows someone because one in 36 people have the diagnosis. Autism isn't just this one disease. We believe it's a spectrum of right. diseases. But Hallie, the big thing is that over the last decade, it's been about 74, one in 74 that had it. So this genetic research shows us that it's much more complicated than we thought and that, in fact, in the fetal cells and development, potentially even in utero, utero when the brain is developing in a, in a fetus, that there are genes that knock things on and off and can interact with each other and can also increase the chances of other diseases that we see with autism. Is there any takeaway to it? The takeaway, I think, is that we now know that it's much more complicated, like all things, than okay. we thought, and that we also need to be kind of cognizant that the genetic factors are not the only factors, that there's also these other life factors that we need more research around. But we see, autism's, we see autism as kind of sitting in the spectrum, and along with other diseases like ep uh, epilepsy and seizure disorders, we see these associations, and we've always wondered as doctors, why is this happening? Now we know there's probably some genetic triggers that work with each other and make that worse. And on the alternative can sometimes if that gene is turned off, and Hallie, this is where it's very cool, we now can do things with CRISPR, a technology right. that edits genes, that can potentially be a, a source of treatment and identifying those genes early on and potentially turning off that interaction. So very important for treatment, mm. very important if you're a parent or if you have a diagnosis of autism yourself, this could lead to some breakthroughs in the following. Years. What about for pregnancy? You talk about fetal development. Pregnancy. Is there any indication right. that, the, that right. any behavioral changes will make a difference? It's a great question, and I think that's why people want to augment this 10 years of research from Stanford with kind of the environment that we have pregnant women and even young babies in. So I think this is all going to be very important. It's probably going to teach us a lot more about, you know, we all worry about when we're pregnant, are we doing the right things, are we not doing the right things? I think this is just going to give us more information, potentially even more genetic testing mm -hmm. that we had when we were pregnant with our blood to understand if those genes are expressed in our fetuses, and that can be important. It's fascinating, yeah. and as you say, a significant breakthrough. Yeah. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you thank so you. much. Good to see you. Coming up, the rush to protect Louisiana's drinking water from being essentially corrupted by salt water. We're on the ground as the Army Corps of Engineers works to slow down what could be a slow-motion disaster. Plus, later, some of the dramatic images coming out of India after flash flooding rips through the Himalayas. Look at that. We'll have more coming up. New Orleans mayor tonight out with an emergency declaration because of the salt water we've told you about making its way from the Gulf of Mexico up the Mississippi River. And that is potentially a huge problem for drinking water in this area. You've got the Army Corps of Engineers today adjusting the timeline for when this could have an effect on New Orleans, saying because they built this underwater barrier, that bought them a little more time. The thinking was maybe New Orleans would see some problems by the end of this month. Now they're thinking maybe next month or longer. Still, if you're not in or around New Orleans, other parts of the state could see this impact much, much sooner, like in the next few days. Some spots are already dealing with this. It's happening because of a drought. There's not enough water flowing down the Mississippi River to push the salt water out. That's the issue. Here's Sam Brock with more. Hallie, I'm in the city of New Orleans right now, next to the Mississippi River. As we know, the, the mayor of New Orleans had declared a state of emergency with officials not just in Orleans Parish, but all over the region, having no idea if they have days or weeks right now to get preparations in order for clean drinking water. That saltwater intrusion is happening, and it's happening south of where I'm standing, not that far, 
maybe a 45 minute drive at most because you have historically low levels on the Mississippi River. Doesn't necessarily look that way when you just sort of glance at it, but it is based on the on the flows of the water. They are not strong enough right now to push denser salt water from the Gulf of Mexico back out into the Gulf. Now, the question that everyone wants to know is how long will it take to progress all the way to New Orleans to the population center where you have about a million people in the greater region, half a million of which are in Jefferson Parish. And everyone right now is trying a combination of things to get ready. Piping, we saw that in Jefferson where they have 15 miles linking upstream to an area that's unaffected by the higher levels of salt. And they're taking that water and bringing it in for their treatment plants. Certainly public officials have been disseminating bottled water, although that is very much uh, available at all the local supermarkets that we saw. Barging, all sorts of different techniques being used right now. We also got to go out earlier today with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This was pretty fascinating. They're constructing a sill, which is basically an underwater barrier where they use this giant drill, take river sediment, move it over, and stack it on top of an existing wall, and it blocks, for the most part, the salt water. But it doesn't provide a permanent solution. This is really just temporary. We spoke with someone from the Army Corps of Engineers about specifically what they need right now. Here's what he told me. All levels of government are throwing everything we have at this problem. And uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the silver bullet is rain. We, we, need, we need rain upstream. As far as a, a specific timeline here, what we are told from officials is it just changed with kind of some comforting news. There's no guarantees here. But the reality is that right now, the latest projections, which they call a forecast of a forecast of a forecast, is that it will only reach the saltwater, Gretna, perhaps in a month and a half, and St. Bernard, which is on the doorstep of New Orleans, but not near the two largest water intakes, which would be close to a best case scenario in, in this instance. But the farther that this saltwater intrusion or wedge goes, the more people that are impacted. The good news right now, again, it's not expected to reach at this point in time, all the way to New Orleans, but it could be thousands upon thousands more people. It's been stuck in the same place, according to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, by that silt for about 13 days now. How long will it hold? That is the question. Back to you. It sure is. Our thanks to Sam Brock for that. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. Because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here is some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Of India, officials say at least 18 people have been killed and more than 100 are still missing. Look at this, after incredibly devastating flash flooding in the Himalayas. There was a bunch of rain that meant a glacial mountain lake burst over its bank. It washed away homes and bridges. They're still doing rescue operations there, and officials say relief camps are being set up for more than 22,000 people. Out of Russia, a court is just sentencing journalist Marina Ovsyanakova to eight and a half years in prison for an on-air protest against the war in Ukraine. She's the journalist who left her home country about a year ago, so the sentence was delivered in absentia, meaning she's not there. Remember, she interrupted a TV broadcast with a sign that read, in part, stop the war, don't believe propaganda. You see it there. And out of Denmark, researchers now think Vikings may have used glass windows centuries before the rest of Europe. Archaeologists found pieces of glass in six excavations across Scandinavia, dating back to the 9th, 12th centuries. They think the Vikings may have gotten the glass through trade or by conquest, essentially, but they probably didn't make it themselves. So listen, one in four of us spend more than 75 bucks a month on streaming subscriptions. That's according to some new numbers out of Finance Buzz. And some experts warn that price is only going to go up. NBC News Now anchor Joe Fryer takes a look at some of the companies planning to raise prices and why. Binging bills are about to see another bump. Is this really happening? Major streamers have announced price increases for nearly every premium plan, and subscribers are seething. I just opened my Hulu, and they're raising their prices to $17.99 a month. What are we paying for? Starting next week, ad-free tiers of Hulu and Disney Plus will cost an extra $3 a month. Well, NBC Universal own Peacock has already raised the price for both of its subscription plans by as much as $2. And Netflix could be next. The Wall Street Journal reports, according to people familiar with the matter, the streaming giant is looking into charging more for its ad-free service after the Hollywood actor's strike ends. While Netflix declined our request for comment, industry experts say the move to increase prices is no plot twist. These price hikes are really about taking these you know, services that are losing a lot of money and trying to make them profitable. 
And the fact that it coincides with the end of the strikes is not a coincidence. With studios and streamers looking to end the more than 90-day-long actors' strike, experts say the new contracts with SAG-AFTRA and the writers' union could cost Hollywood hundreds of millions of dollars. Some customers feel they're having to foot the bill. The immediate reaction is anger because it's like, how much more can you possibly ask from us? These higher prices may just be the beginning. Next year, more streamers are expected to crack down on password sharing. During an earnings call, Disney CEO Bob Iger said they'll address the issue in 2024. The company owns streaming services Hulu, ESPN Plus, and Disney Plus. It comes after Netflix said it shut down on sharing, helped it add nearly 6 million new subscribers. <laughs> Now, with the actors' strike putting Hollywood on hold, studios are hoping to keep revenue streaming. Joe Fryer, NBC News. Our thanks to Joe Fryer for that reporting. Up next, we've got more on more high prices, not for streaming, but for chicken. And when you may see some relief at the grocery store. Plus, some explosive accusations against the longtime leader of Abercrombie and Fitch, the newly launched investigation into claims of exploitation and misconduct after the break. Abercrombie and Fitch tonight hiring a law firm to look into allegations of sex abuse against its former CEO. The allegations, originally published by the BBC, accuse Mike Jeffries of exploiting young men and recruiting them for sex parties. At least some of the parties are alleged to have happened while Jeffries was head of, obviously, Abercrombie, the big clothing company. They announced Jeffries' retirement in 2014 after 22 years. A spokesman tonight telling NBC News the company was appalled and disgusted by the allegations. Jeffrey's lawyer declined to comment to NBC. No criminal charges have been filed. Maura Barrett is joining us now. Help us understand some of the allegations here and what the company might be looking for in this investigation since Jeffrey's not even in the job. He's been out of the job for almost a decade. That's right, Hallie. It has been quite some time, and it is important to note that there have been no criminal charges filed just yet. This investigation just coming to light with this BBC reporting this week. And basically, it lays out that they spoke to 12 men alleging that they were involved in organizing uh, and planning and attending these sex parties. And some of these men say that they felt exploited, uh, and some even uh, created claim or said had claims of abuse. And so they're speaking out about this now. The BBC spoke with several of them on the record and on camera. And as you noted, uh, Jeffrey's uh, attorney declined to comment, but he also noted that Jeffrey's in general has a practice of not commenting on personal matters. Uh, and this is, a prof this is a question of professional. So that's why they said that they're declining to comment. But it's important to also note uh, that at the same time, just before Jeffrey's left Abercrombie and Fitch, there, there are allegations uh, that there were legal settlements over, quote, misconduct claims. Now, we don't know if this is tied to these sex parties, if any of these people involved overlap, but it is something to po important to point out, especially considering uh, that the company is saying that they were surprised and appalled and disgusted, as you laid out. Now, the BBC is sticking by their reporting, pointing to the fact that several of these men are on the record. They also say that they did e extensive corroboration, fact-checking over the last two years, a two-year investigation, talking with dozens of sources, as well as housekeepers uh, they have a that were that were involved in the parties. Um, they also did a lot of cross-checking with uh, flight tickets, um, because all of this apparently happened across the world in major cities. And so this is something they're sticking by, and clearly some very serious allegations that Jeffries is facing right now, Hallie. Maura Barrett, thank you very much. Listen, if you've gone shopping for chicken lately, you've probably noticed it is getting more expensive. In fact, some new numbers out show that price for a pound of chicken Record high, up 4% from last year. More than that, actually. It's almost $2 a pound for a whole chicken. And more people want chicken, too. For the first time ever, people are expected to eat 100 pounds of chicken on average. So a hunger for it, even though companies are producing less of it. Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver, our economic analyst, is joining us now. Man, like, we were hoping we were over some of this inflation stuff. Eggs were really expensive, but... Chicken is costing a lot of money for people who are buying it, right? So if all these people want to eat it, why are companies cutting back the supply? 
Yeah, well, you said 100 pounds per person on average in this country. We do eat a lot of chicken, but believe it or not, the forecasts were even for more consumption this year based on what they saw last year. The big chicken producers, Tyson, Purdue, Cargo Foods, it's just that demand has not been as strong this year, so they've actually cut production. And in the case of Tyson Foods, they closed six plants, laid off 4,700 workers. They got freezers full of chicken that's not even come to the market yet. But the other po uh, protein prices are high, too. Beef prices and pork prices. When those prices are up, chicken is the next choice, usually, for people when they want to get their protein. That's why those prices are high. 100 pounds of chicken per year. Um, same can't be said for meat and pork, uh, like meaning beef, right? Like, why is that? Yeah, because we're eating less and less beef and pork as a country. You see more of that happening in places like China, where pork consumption is very high. But we're eating less and less of that protein. Last year was a banner year, a bull market, you could call it, for protein prices. It's just that the producers thought that would continue into this year. It really hasn't, and that's why you have this oversupply. So they're cutting supply now, holding it back to raise prices. And since those other prices for beef, again, and pork are so high, that flows down to chicken prices. Consumption makes a big difference here. But yeah. that's why you're seeing the high prices. They'll probably be with us through the rest of the year, at least. Caleb Silver, uh, not necessarily the news folks wanted to hear. Thank you very much for that. Coming up in tonight's original, our Gotti Schwartz, ice bathing in the name of science to see if biohacking his body can keep him young forever. And sending me this video while he was out in the field. I'm just in the hyperbaric chamber for you, Hallie. This is going to be a really funny story. Are you not entertained? He's gonna join us in just a second. Don't miss it. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And listen, there's a lot of people who are looking to figure out what exactly is the fountain of youth. How can they keep their bodies at peak performance at all times? For some of these folks. It's about taking matters into their own hands, right? The idea of biohacking, hacking your own biology. It can get pretty expensive and kind of extreme. So is it for everyone? NBC's Gotti Schwartz takes a look. It's a health craze taking over the internet with over 700 million views on TikTok, hashtag biohacking, or hacking your body, which some will think will create a better version of yourself. Everything from wearable tech to diet shifts, gene analysis, it's the do-it-yourself approach to health, but the DIY lifestyle can be a little lonely, so why not do it together? And that's what brings me to Remedy Place, looking for the fountain of youth on Sunset Boulevard. So we're a whole entire club center around self-care, but with a social twist. Here you can breathe your way into the six-minute ice bath oh, club. Good, to control the breath, relax the shoulders. How once wide awake. Healing has never felt did so it. cool. How about a little relaxing in the hyperbaric chambers? Okay. Meant to help increase your oxygen intake to speed up your body's healing process. I feel pretty good. What's not so relaxing? The price tag of $2,500 a month, which gets an all-access member Cryotherapy, cupping, acupuncture, lymphatic massages, automatic foam rollers, vitamin IV drips, and more. The effectiveness of many of these treatments often unclear. For example, those vitamin IV drips, a large review of medical literature shows no clear results for those with major issues, let alone for healthy people, where it's often compared to simple hydration. But Dr. Leary, a chiropractor and founder of The Remedy Place, says the idea is about finding healthier ways to socialize meeting spot, after work hangout instead of a happy hour. Here's how he reframes the booming trend. We don't biohack, we remedy. Because there is no shortcuts with your health. The global biohacking industry valued at nearly $17 billion last year and is projected to reach more than $80 billion by 2031. And for extreme biohackers, it is not cheap. Take 46-year-old biohacking millionaire Brian Johnson, who I met up with earlier this year. He says he spends about $2 million a year trying to be 18 again, basically aging backwards. Well, we're trying to basically measure every single organ in the entire body, and then we're trying to rejuvenate the age. Which means some extremes. He takes over 100 pills a day, wears a tiny contraption on, well, his other Johnson to monitor nighttime erections. 
He even injected his son's plasma in him, something which he stopped doing after he said it had no benefits. Johnson says everyone doesn't have to follow his exact move, but they can use it as a guide, which a lot of people do. Teresa Skrobonik's goal was simple, live longer and look younger. I came from a family that never took care of themselves, smoked two, three packs of cigarettes a day, and they all died early. And so I thought, I'm going to do the exact opposite. She started taking handfuls of supplements and prescriptions, but they didn't have the impact she wanted. I felt worse than I did before I took it. I started getting headaches. I was taking naps twice a day. The obsession impacting her mentally. I wasn't really living. I was living to take the pills so later I could live. Now she cautions people, emphasizing working with your doctor and knowing what your body needs. I started using my body and my diet and started just doing the things I was deficient in, and I just feel a lot better. Back at Remedy Place, they're not hesitating to jump in and try to rethink health. There you go. There is no quick fix. That's because you're repairing. Mm -hmm. You're not anti-aging. Aging is inevitable, but doing it as best you can, that's priceless. Fresh off his ice bath is Gotti Schwartz joining us now live. <laughs> and Gotti, like, I am glad you talked about the, the idea of how effective is this actually, right? Because there is a very tiny slice of, I think, the American people who can actually afford to do this, even if it were to work. And that's still a big question mark here, right? That's a huge question mark. And so the place that we went to, Remedy Place, the pitch is this. It's, it's a place that you can go on a date. And I was like, wait, people are going to bring a date to an ice bath? And they said, yeah, well, you know, you go to a bar, you spend a bunch of money on booze, and you're killing brain cells during that night if you're drinking a lot. Here you come and you spend a bunch of money, and instead you're doing things that are better for your body. I got to say, that ice bath, I was like, this is the worst first date idea ever. Say when that. I went in. <laughs> but then after, Hallie, after you get out of the ice bath, all you want to do is, like, hug and get warm. So I don't know. I mean, if you make it through the ice bag, maybe it's genius. Uh, again, the efficacy, I, I have no idea. All I know is that that night that I took that ice bath and then did the hyperbaric chamber, I track all my sleep, and that was the one night that I got, like, an hour and a half of the deep sleep, allegedly, according to my, my watch here. So uh, maybe it was because I was freezing cold for a while and I didn't sure. warm up for another two hours. Or, or maybe it was something else. Uh, but they say that this is just about finding healthy alternatives to socialization uh, as opposed to going out on the town with your friends. Listen, z zero judgment. We're a, we're a zero judgment show here, right? And, like, the romance aspect aside here, like, it, and I'm not asking to be facetious, is there any functional difference between, like, an ice bath, just as an example, and just, like, taking a cold shower at your house for a little while? Uh, that's a that's a big question, and, and actually, the ice bath, in terms of the things that they offered at this place, the Remedy Place, is probably the cheapest, easiest thing that you could do at home. Ice bath is ice cubes in a bath. Most people have access to that, yeah. and they say that there are health benefits and that everybody should do that. Then they've got the cryo chamber that they say That's actually right. didn't get uh, as cold or make your body get as cold as it is in the ice bath. But then they do have some very uh, technical pieces of equipment. One of the things that they showed cost like $32,000. They said it was FDA approved, yeah. and it gave you this massage to clean out your system. I only did those two for you, Hallie. I draw the line after ice bath, but I'm I'm going to have to go back and, and be a guinea pig because there's nothing I won't do for you. <laughs> I was just going to say, man, and uh, the, the text from inside the hyperbaric chamber, thank you for letting us show that to the, to the people, a little glimpse into, sure. into what our life is like. Gotti Schwartz, um, amazing yeah. reporting. Thank you so much. We will look for more from you. Uh, watch Gotti. Stay tuned now tonight, 8 Eastern here on NBC News. Now, do not miss it. That does it for us this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.